Discovery of special relativity was a massive success for Albert Einstein. Due to this discovery, he was offered a professorship at some prestigious universities like in Zurich and later in Prague, which not only freed him from the patent office, but he could now fully unleash his potential as a physicist and also have a high standard of living. Despite his success, Einstein wasn't very happy about the theory he created. And the reason for this unsatisfaction lies in one of the principles of the theory, in particular the principle of relativity, which states that the laws of physics are the same in every inertial frame of reference. So in simple words, if you were alone in the universe, there would be no way to tell if you are moving or not. Simple constant velocity cannot be felt or detected. So any two observers that are moving with a constant velocity in a straight line relative to each other will experience the same physics. So a practical example of this would be a cruise on a massive ship, on a very calm sea. If you were indoors, you can do anything as on the ground, like playing a football or tennis, you don't have to adjust your playing style to the velocity of the ship, because the physics you experience is the same. And that will be all nice if these inertial frames actually existed in our universe. Because the moment you put any mass or energy into our universe, the number of inertial frames goes from infinity down to zero. And the reason is simple. Because if you put any mass into the universe, it creates attractive force on every object with a different strength and orientation. And therefore, all objects will always have a non-zero relative acceleration among them. And this is what bothered Einstein about the special theory of relativity, because it works only on a frames that don't exist in our universe. And it was all due to this one word in the postulate of special relativity. Einstein called it a special principle of relativity, because it only applies to a special frames of reference. But imagine what would happen if you just erased this word from the principle. This is what Einstein called a general principle of relativity. But what kind of theory you would get? Can you just erase one word from the principle and be completely okay? Well, such a statement like general principle of relativity is just too much to ask for and it would make the special relativity completely paradoxical. If you took the famous twin paradox experiment, where observer A is floating in space and the observer B makes a round trip towards a distant destination and back, since acceleration is absolute, both observers agree on who was inertial the whole time and only such observer can use special relativity to calculate the elapsed time of the observer B. But the B observer can't use special relativity to calculate the time of the observer A. And the reason is that during his journey, he was in a state where this special principle of relativity didn't hold, and the special relativity was broken. If you try to run the same experiment, but this time using general principle of relativity, then you would immediately run into a problem, because now the observer B can claim that it was you who accelerated, and he was at rest the whole time, which would grant him the right to use the same equations to calculate the time on the clock of the observer A but the result would be contradictory with the observer's A prediction. Not to mention that you could clearly feel that your frame is accelerated. Just try to play tennis or football on a plane that is just taking off of a runway. So just a naive promotion of the principle of relativity to accelerated frames won't work, as we get a theory full of paradoxes. Yet, due to gravity, there is not a single inertial frame in the entire universe. And this is why Einstein wasn't very happy about his theory. So, 
there was a big task ahead of him. How to make special relativity work on accelerated frames. But what is the acceleration in the first place? If you have two inertial frames, the relative velocity between them is always constant, meaning it is always one particular number that never changes. If there is an acceleration involved, then the velocity evolves with time, which we denote as dv over dt. And the meaning of this notation is how the velocity changes if we make a small shift in time. This is mathematically all very simple and nice, but it doesn't give us any way to determine which one of these two frames is accelerated and which one is not. And for this, there is a Newton's law which states that all bodies remain at rest or constant linear motion unless there is a force acting on the body. This force is equal to the mass and the rate of acceleration of the body, according to this equation. But of course the force doesn't come out of nowhere, there must be a cause and effect. So if you have a body, the force won't appear without any reason. It is caused by a reactive force of the rocket exhaust, so that overall momentum of the system remains unchanged. So in simple words, if I am in an inertial frame and I take, for example, this uh, marker here and I place it anywhere in space and I drop it, it must remain at the same position. So if I do it, it will fall down. So that means that I am not in an inertial frame. Well, according to Newton, what happens to the marker is that the moment I place it somewhere above the ground, the gravitational force starts acting on it. And when it hits the ground, the gravitational force will be compensated by the repulsive force of the ground, and the marker remains at the same position, and therefore it is inertial. But now we can ask a simple question. What would we experience if we were freely falling with the marker. And already in the 15th century, Galileo Galilei demonstrated on the Leaning Tower of Pisa that the rate of acceleration is independent of the mass of the body. And therefore, if I were freely falling with the marker, it would be stationary relative to me, and therefore it would feel like I am in an inertial frame. And this was the key idea to the Einstein's problem with gravity, and it was to just get rid of it completely, and instead focus on experiences. In Einstein's view, if the marker is freely falling, it experiences no force, and therefore it is in an inertial frame, whereas me sitting here, I am accelerated upwards by the ground towards the marker. So, gravitational acceleration is not caused by any force, and therefore all these objects are still in an inertial frame, despite having non-zero relative acceleration among them. Only a force that you can feel and detect will make your frame being non-inertial, like, for example, me sitting here on the chair. And that is why this marker will appear as accelerated down despite being inertial. And suddenly the number of inertial frames in the universe goes from zero back to infinity, as any free fall can be considered as inertial frame. And moreover, the force that is pushing me upwards is not gravitational, because it is the ground that is pushing me up, and therefore the nature of this force must be the same as I were in Accelerate the Rocket. So free fall is the same as inertial motion, and being on the surface of the planet is the same as being in an accelerated rocket, because the physics and our experiences are the same. This is called the equivalence principle. However, this only applies locally, because 
If your observer is freely falling towards the center of a massive body, then objects will appear as approaching each other, since all of them want to cross the center of the body. Whereas, if there was not a massive body, there would be no such behavior. So the equivalence principle holds only locally in a small area around the observer. Such frames we call locally inertial frames. And now you can make the general principle of relativity work, because acceleration can be relative now. If you have two observers in a free fall, they experience the same physics, despite having non-zero relative acceleration. And therefore, both of them have the right to claim being stationary and the other in accelerated motion. You can also solve the twin paradox from the reference frame of the observer B as being stationary the whole time, because at the turnaround he experiences a uniform gravitational field as his rocket is pushing him against the floor. And in this gravitational field the observer A accelerates towards him, and you can calculate the missing time on the observer's A clock at the arrival due to gravitational blue shift. So raising this word inertial requires you to add the equivalence principle to the postulates. But one question remains unanswered, and it's how. How can two objects have relative acceleration despite not feeling any force? And how can the ground of a planet be accelerated upwards and not expand in space? And the answer to this is that massive objects curve the space-time itself. So all objects move in a straight line but on a curved manifold. This nicely explains how two bodies can have non-zero relative acceleration, but it kind of struggles to explain why planets are not expanding in space if the ground is pushing us upwards. And the reason is that not only space is curved, but also time, and therefore making a good demonstration of this phenomena is quite challenging. The best I can recommend is this video from the Science Click English or this one from Dialect, as their animation capabilities are far superior to mine. But in a nutshell, you can sort of imagine it as if the space was flowing into the massive body and the repulsive force of the matter is preventing you to follow the geodesics. And this is the starting point for general relativity. Einstein had to figure out how massive objects influence the curvature of the space-time around them, to have a theory that's actually useful. So the idea was an equation that would tell you about the geometry of the space-time given a certain mass and energy distribution. The geometry of a manifold is given by a metric, which physicists denote as g. And therefore, on the left side, there must be a certain function of metric tensor, whereas on the right side, there must be a so-called stress-energy tensor, multiplied by a certain proportionality constant. And eventually, Einstein managed to find the correct equation, or better to say, equations for the metric tensor coefficients. And this is how it looks like where these terms here are just another functions of the metric tensor. It looks like just one equation, but these indices run from 0 to 3, and you have to solve this equation for each combination of the indices. But since the metric tensor is symmetric, you will end up with a system of 10 nonlinear partial differential equations for the metric tensor coefficients. So you can only imagine that it's not very easy to solve, although some analytical solutions have been found. For example, outside of a spherical mass, which we call Schwarzschild solution. You might notice that the image quality of this video has improved. 
And it's all thanks to this man, Glenn Northrop, who contributed $800 for a new camera equipment. This is truly amazing. I can't thank you enough for this. And I only hope that this created a better experience for all of you. Huge thanks also for all of you who supported me on Patreon, Coffees, or Super Thanks. I appreciate it a lot. By the way, do you know what are the most common mistakes in special relativity that people make? If not, just check out this video next and I see you there.